Our final speaker in the morning session is uh, Bjorn Wagner. Uh, he's co-founder of both um, uh, Parity Networks and uh, uh, Polkadot Networks and Parity, and he's going to be talking a little bit about like the Parity and Substrate projects and how a combination of the two are sort of driving forward blockchain innovation. So if we could give it up for Bjorn before he starts. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Bjorn Wagner and I'm here with Parity Technologies. And for those of you that don't know our company, we are a team of 80 people by now, got started four years ago and we really focus on building open source protocols uh, based on cryptographic primitives and peer-to-peer -peer technologies. And really overall our goal is to enable a new generation of application engineers, right, that can fundamentally reinvent the way that digital services um, can be designed and applications can be engineered in the web. And today I want to tell you about two of, the, two of the technologies that we are insanely excited about, Polkadot and Substrate, um, how we believe they will help supercharge innovation in our space. But for the first five or ten minutes, I want to take a bit of time to just like walk you through why do we bother, why do we go to work every day. I might have to press it. So, um, you all know these news, right? Like, we've all read them over the past years, but it's, in my opinion, really important to remind ourselves what that actually means, right? NSA leak internet giants, let governments tap your data. We have seen academics criticize NSA GCHQ for weakening our online encryption. Most of you probably had this, you know, this moment when you first downloaded WhatsApp, right? Your friend told you about it, said like, hey, there's this cool app, we can connect, we can talk over it, right? And then you did it and you pressed that button and then you were like, why the hell do I have to share my entire address book? All my contacts, my doctors, my ex-boyfriends, my ex-boyfriends, whatever, right? With, uh, with this company. And that really, you know, Let's you ask, like, something is terribly wrong here. Something went completely wrong. And another example is, like, how much is your data worth if Google can pay billions and billions of dollars to Apple to remain the default for the Safari browser, right? But it's not just misaligned monetization strategies of these services that we use, right? It, the very infrastructure risk of centralized control that we're exposed to again and again. One example was this terrible, terrible hack of Equifax, right, that exposed 143 million Americans' social security numbers. And last but not least, even the very creator of the World Wide Web, right, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, now acknowledges and admits and acts on the realization that the internet is broken by design. What does that mean? Well, you know, the tools we rely on to communicate, to understand, to, you know, interact and base decisions on in the digital realms are broken. And our only fallback today is trust, right? The trust in the very same people that are incentivized to keep our tools broken. Think WhatsApp in that case. Now, let us rewind to 92. You know, there was a time when Microsoft was still calling open source a cancer, right? When we had um, these words floating around, information superhighway as well as internet addict, that were buzzwords back then just as ICOs and, um, and hodling are today, right? And I was told that back then everything was bare bones and felt empowering very similar to how we feel today about blockchain. Now, in the 20 years following that time back then, right, when the internet emerged, the internet started to change society. And, you know, however, as our imagination inspired services and applications, and these services and applications really helped push the development of infrastructure, there was no backstop that would prevent entrenched societal structures, right, from manifesting themselves on the internet. And 
as the world got online, we replicated our society's melodies. But there's one important point, right? Given its digital nature, it was so much faster and harder and stronger and more discreet than conventional totalitarian power structures of the past. There was no backstop for the accumulation of power. And this is what leads us to here, right? Like, that leads us to a situation if, in which, if we want to connect with our friends, right, we have to appeal to and trust Facebook. If we want to share the last restaurant bill, we have to rely on um, the PayPal on Venmo's of this world to facilitate. And if we want to share our thoughts on crypto, you know, we are ex exposed to the risk that Medium or Twitter just cuts us out from today to tomorrow. And I think the reality seems to be that unless we put in place open software protocols, our, that you know, our digital infrastructure will, will magnify society melodies, right? And it will not just limit it. So that's why we think we need something like Web3. Like we have these buzzwords now where we say, oh, less trust, more truth. But really, Web3 is like a reliable means to help your application stay useful in adverse conditions. And adverse conditions can be intentional hacks. They can as well be unintentional catastrophes, right? As well, we see it as a, as a new way of empowering builders, creators out there uh, that don't have to rely as much as they have today to do today on you know, these, the benevolence of the platforms that they build on top. And you know, there are several bits and pieces, different technologies that have to be in place for making that a reality. And while we had BitTorrent and end-to-end -end encrypted messaging uh, been around for several years, right? it was really the invention of um, blockchain technology that made it possible to hard code expectation management. Right? To, to allow us to send economically strong signals. And you know, blockchains allow us to encode these strong rules and trust into the applications we build. And over these past years, we all, like a lot of the people here in this room, have been experimenting with these new properties of that technology. But what we've seen is that it has, very become, it has become very clear that the technology wasn't ready yet. And despite, despite these incremental changes and improvements right, that we've seen over the years, everyone who is building today, I believe, knows that there is still a lot of work to be done before this reality, this future becomes reality. And some of these areas where we really have to put in a lot of work is, you've heard it before, scalability, governance, privacy, interoperability. There was a recent post uh, about app infrastructure cycle by Fred Wilson from USV, where he claimed that the failure to build an application is really what leads to uh, innovation on a platform or infrastructure level. And I think that largely makes sense, right? However, if you look at the blockchain space, what you will see is that some of the shortcomings are far from obvious, far from clear to realize. And absolutely not easy to solve. So while we all might, for example, have a more or less intuitive understanding of what that issue of scalability is, right? It's far less clear, for example, what the issue of interoperability is or the issue of governance, right? It has so many shades of gray, so many different colors. Think about the block size debate in Bitcoin or the DAO hard fork in Ethereum. Now, what else is preventing us from innovating faster on that base layer, on that infrastructure layer? Well, I would say what we've seen over these years is that there are like these elite ruling groups really developing, developing for segregated networks, for isolated networks, incentivizing the centralization of power within those networks, where decisions are really being made for often the wrong reasons. And if you couple that together with the lack of trustless, of being able to trustlessly recognize another chain, this other isolated chain, right? You really get to a point where you have these network exec 
effects resulting in maximalism, maximalism, which really is the peer-to-peer -peer equivalent of nationalism. And I think more importantly, what we have seen is a slowdown in terms of innovation on this base layer because of that. And that is really a tragedy because we desperately need innovation on that level. History or the last couple of years has shown us that blockchains that seemed well equipped for future demands, you know, think Bitcoin, think Ethereum, right, have at some point really struggled to keep up with the new developments and requirements. Now, creating a system in which blockchains could coexist and complement each other had the potential to really overcome this chain maximalism and help us further innovate. Imagine, for example, a blockchain where all the shards in a sharded system, right, could have different tasks. They could be entirely different in nature. They would enable a landscape of very specialized charts, and charts in that sense are blockchains itself, right? And they wouldn't have the usual trade-offs that come with specialized blockchains and also systems in general. Right now, a lot of, what a lot of blockchains out there, new blockchain systems are trying to do is like trying to solve everything at once, right? They're incorporating everything from smart contract modules, currency, governance, uh, staking, on whatsoever. Um, but that really doesn't lead to where you go, right? Because if you construct your application on one of these chains, you're bound to the platform's limitations and bottlenecks and its future governance decisions. So on the flip side, you obviously profit from the network effects, from the platform's existing user base. But if we had a chance to let these, like an option, like an like a ability to let these very specialized things, these very specialized charts talk to each other and communicate, right? We would be able to negotiate the trade-offs between specialization on one hand and generalization, because the interoperability recovers the network from um, um, the network effects that would usually hinder specialized chains. And this is what has led us to building these two technologies that I will be talking about now. On one hand, we have the interoperable multi-chain platform Polkadot, which is a network of interconnected, specialized, secure chains. And on the other hand, we have Substrate, which is a framework for easily creating application-specific blockchains. So if you look back at our, the past three years at Parity, we have developed uh, to date four different blockchain implementation clients. We have um, uh, built the most performant Ethereum client. We have built a Bitcoin implementation from scratch. We are building a Zcash implementation from scratch. And we built Polkadot. And we've taken really all the learnings from building these different client implementations and deploying private networks for some, some clients on large clay, scale to come up with a generic framework, right, that lets allow others to piggyback on that experience so that they don't have to reinvent the damn wheel every time, right? So, right. And, I strongly believe there is still so much technology that needs to be developed and needs to be innovated, needs to be researched. And Kathy made a great example with bulletproofs, right? Like, if you could innovate on that level, please, why would you try to reinvent the wheel and build, again, the 10th networking library for your blockchain? And that is kind of what we want to solve, one of these problems with Substrate. So Polkadot, it's its crucial counterpart, right? because it's the network interface. It's kind of the network card you can plug into any chain built on Substrate, right? And it, it ensures that innovative chains that are built on Substrate don't suffer the network effects of the incumbent, but rather prosper from being interoperable. And Polkadot really connects arbitrary, and when I say arbitrary, I mean arbitrary, application-specific blockchains. And the very unique characteristic of how Polkadot, the Polkadot network does that um, as an interoperability framework is that it enables completely arbitrary smart contract calls across blockchains. 
it doesn't even have to be necessarily a smart contract call. It can be just a, some kind of arbitrary message call. And last but not least, thanks to the wasn't bedrock of Polkadot, these chains that are being, um, being built and that can talk to each other can actually be implemented in a number of different, with a number of different tool chains, be it Go, Rust, C++, or any other tool chain or language that eventually compiles down to WebAssembly. The only thing, obviously, you have to make sure is that it follows a certain specific function interface that the Polkadot network can understand. But it doesn't really limit um, the ability of um, designing your state transition function or the logic of your chain. Now, why do we believe these two technologies can actually make a difference? If you look at the pro and contrast of app-specific chains, there are a few really good arguments. Number one, performance, right? Bottleneck VM, single app optimized for state machine. If you really are trying to only do one thing, you can do this one thing way better than if you try to cover all, all potential use cases as you do in like smart contract chains. Security, right? The attack surface of a very specialized, very limited functionality chain is way smaller. Sovereignty, right? Sovereignty. If you are not like, if you are two applications that have really maybe disparate interests, you're not bound to the same space, to the same design space, then that to some extent solves the governance problem. And last but not least, a higher degree of flexibility of what you can implement and how you implement it. Well, the two contrapoints are obviously network effects, right? If your chain is disparate, if you are isolated, you have a problem, right? And the second is engineering effort. And these problems are real, right? If you look, uh, yeah. if you look at what, um, there are a bunch of like different startups out there or projects that have really tried to build a blockchain from scratch. I would be um, interested to see is there anyone in this room that has tried to implement a blockchain client from scratch? Now, has anyone worked on, on a fork of a, of a blockchain client? Okay, a few. You guys probably know how hard it is to implement that from scratch, right? And we see, I, I've brought a few screenshots from some tweets, right, where we have seen how um, building your own blockchain from scratch has gone terribly wrong, right? And this is one part. The other part that's even way harder is securing that blockchain that you've built yourself, right? Creating the economic incentives that there are people that validate your chain and make sure it's secure. And not a good idea, right? And that is why we believe, you know, this, the combination of a framework, right, that makes it so much easier to build blockchains, application-specific blockchains like Substrate, and Polkadot, right, that takes care of securing you whatever you build and enabling to be able to talk to the other things that build really makes sense. Now, here's a quick overview to get it in perspective because like, I know sometimes it's hard to understand you know, all these different words and these different entities. So when we talk about Polkadot, I mostly mean a protocol, and for me it's something like Ethernet, right? It allows us to connect these things. Um, Substrate is a software, it's more like the PC. And like, if you think about Polkadot, what comes to mind is as well, the Web3 Foundation, it's an entity um, created and it has a deed to really um, shepherd the system into reality. Um, and it has, it's a protocol, it has a token, but it has many teams and in fact, many implementations. Parity Technology is now only one out of three companies building a Pol Polkadot implementation. The other two being Chainsafe and Suramitsu. Uh, one in, in Go and one in C++. Now, uh, Substrate is more like a parity technology, is tech stack. It's really something we built and we imagined. Um, and you can have many Substrate chains. It can have many tokens. It does need to have a token when you build a chain, right? It can have a, uh, also a really different data structure than what you're used to from blockchains today. And I think one thing that I want to point out is like Polkadot, really doesn't want to be in competition with these next generation chains. It is really more there to you know, create this collaborative commons 
that really empowers everyone and helps everyone to innovate in the spaces rather than trying everyone to fight against each other. Now, a bit, I want to make a few more points about substrate, you know, give you something at hand what substrate is and what you get with substrate. So substrate was designed to be as generic and easy to build with as possible, right? We try to maximize the technical freedom, security, and connectivity. And we try to minimize the effort, the constraints, and the opinionation it comes with. Now, how general is Polkadot really? I would say it's extremely general. It has a very, very abstract block format. It's agnostic with regard to the crypto databases you can, you can have it with. Um, the execute block function, right, is defined or described in WASM, which, as I said before, lets you use any of a range of tool chains, right, that compile, time, compile down to WASM. Now, on the other hand, right, like that was what we just described was mostly the runtime and what kind of logic or what kind of um, flavor of blockchain you can implement. Now, on the other hand, right, the consensus aspect of Substrate, it comes with pluggable consensus. So you can choose out of a range of different consensus mechanisms. And I've listed a few here, a few we have implemented, a few we still want to implement, right? One uh, I want to point out specifically is Grandpa. Um, it's a ghost-based recursive ancestor-derived prefix agreement. And what it really is, um, it's a very uh, novel finality gadget, a finality gadget um, invented by uh, a guy named Al from the Web3 Foundation. He's a mathematician. And it's pretty cool because what it does effectively, it allows um, finality validators to um, vote on chains rather than blocks. And you, let's say you have a block in a, that is a common ancestor of a lot of chains, right? As soon as this block has achieved two-thirds uh, of staked weight votes from the validators, it's finalized, right? Um, but what we present for the first time with Substrate is some kind of hybrid consensus model where you have a block production decoupled from, from finality, and the block production um, is very progressive um, and doesn't need finality immediately, but rather we use grandpa, and grandpa, you know, if you, have, if you are in good network conditions, you know, you don't have any network partitions, you potentially even come to finality on each block. But if, you know, the network um, partitions and you have bad network conditions, then as soon as the network, condition, uh, network partitions are resolved, grandpa can finalize up to millions of blockers at once. And basically, what do you get with Substrate when you build with it? You get hot swappable, pluggable consensus, you get hot swappable, um, uh, pluggable straight transition function. And this is kind of a big deal, because what that means is you can upgrade your running blockchain on the fly without hard forks. You can upgrade consensus and the logic, the state machine of your blockchain without the risk of a hard fork. And there's a bunch of other stuff you get. Another really novel, cool thing I think uh, we will ship it with. It's not yet done, but it's pretty cool. It's off-chain workers, oracles, um, if you want to find out more, join our channel to reach out to us. Happy to walk you through. Um, yeah, and Substrate comes with a bunch of different, in a bunch of different flavors from, uh, in a different kind of um, abstraction layers. You can look at it from Polka.core, it's the most abstract, up to Substrate node, which is the most concrete, which is a blockchain implementation, a concrete one where you have a, a smart contract chain with governance and staking. And the perfect trade-off, in my opinion, is what we call the Substrate Module Runtime Library that um, presents a bunch of different modules that is highly composable, and you can just pick and plug in different modules that you want in order to compose your chain. For example, if you want to create a proof of stake smart contract blockchain, you would take Substrate Core, you would take the accounts and balances module, you would take the staking module, you would take the contracts module. You would plug it together and you have your chain. And if you want to have another aspect, for example, state channels, whatever, you implement that module and plug it in as well. And so last thing I want to point out is what can you build with Substrate? I pointed, I think, a lot. 
what is being built right now. For example, we built Ethereum 2.0 on top of Substrate. We have uh, Aragon that is planning on building decentralized organization network, Aragon OS on Polkadot. We have Edge, we are currently building a safe improving smart contract platform on Polkadot. And if you want to learn Substrate, right, I can only highly recommend you check out our um, um, tutorials. Here's one by Gavin. We have another one by um, my colleague, Sean. Um, a CryptoKitties tutorial that walks you through in a couple of hours how you build your own blockchain and replicate the CryptoKitties example. Um, and you can find all of that together in our developer hub on docs.substrate.dev. Last but not least, join us for the second Web3 Summit in August. If you want to find out more, if you want to learn a bit more about this ecosystem and other teams, what they are building. Um, Parity is hiring, not only developers. So um, if you're excited, just reach out to us. We take um, speculative applications as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>